Hey folks, how's it going? Another video on employee benefits and COVID-19. This one is on state and local leave laws. i going to cover some specific ones and also just some general ones, especially that might apply to future changes in various jurisdictions. And this is time sensitive. So remember, uh, this one is as of April 7, 2020. So uh, watch out for that. If anything might change, uh, you want to make sure to catch it. Disclaimer, it's not legal advice, not selling any anything here. And uh, this is just my opinion, nobody else's. Uh, I hope you find it useful, but once again, it might change. So uh, please check that laws haven't changed in the applicable jurisdiction if you want to make any decisions. Roadmap, uh, we'll go over some just general changes that are out there so you can understand what's happening. We'll go into the New York law, then the Colorado law, which is a little different, and the Los Angeles law, which uh, has its own contours, and then just some general COVID-19 leave issues in other places. So starting off with just the general COVID-19 changes to paid and unpaid family leave and sick leave. What, what adjustments are we seeing out there? In general, they're mostly adjusting existing laws to just say that sick leave, family leave, they apply to COVID-19 situations. So you don't necessarily get any extra time in a lot of these laws. Uh, they're just letting you use the existing leave under that law. Uh, but expanding the situations to cover COVID-19. And it's a lot of jurisdictions, so uh, it's sort of useful to, to see that that's likely to happen even in the future. So, for example, under a sick time law, if a doctor recommends isolation or a public official or a health board quarantines you and on an individualized basis, so not a shelter in place, but an individualized quarantine order, uh, they're saying that that counts as a sick leave. Basically, you are sick, even if you're not actually sick and you're not, or you're, you have COVID-19, but you're not symptomatic. Uh, you, nevertheless, you can use it. So that's just sort of updating the law to match the situation and keep people home so they don't infect others. Uh, some of the laws it go as far as to cover workplace closures, either closure by a health authority or closure for safety reasons, or in some places, any closure at all. Uh, so that's less common, but that is out there. That's not really sick time, but because of the general pandemic, uh, a lot of sick leave laws are being used to cover that. And then also, if you're in a vulnerable population, you're not sick, but it is a risk to your health. So whether it's age or a pre-existing health factor or risk factor, uh, some of the leave laws are, are letting you use sick time as well. So uh, in family leave, it's a little different, but similarly, they're just expanding. So COVID-19 situations like a quarantine, an isolation recommendation, uh, a school closure, a facility closure, a caregiver unavailable, all of those things could get you uh, family leave is, is really the adjustment. And uh, a lot of these, again, they're just letting you access your existing sick leave, your existing family leave, whether paid or unpaid. And to treat that, whether it's an isolation order or recommendation or school closure, treat it, treat it as an illness uh, without giving you separate PTO in most cases um, and not giving you any extra coronavirus only um, leave. So if you are if you're an employer and you've got discretionary PTO, a single single bank of time for all all leave and employees can just pull from it when they want. Uh, obviously you don't have to adjust for a lot of these. You're you're already allowing people uh, to use COVID-19 or any other reason. You could you could have nice day leave. Really all it is as is uh, employees have the discretion. So the only change is if someone says a protected reason uh, then they need to get priority. Uh, obviously that has to be allowed, but the written policy doesn't have to be adjusted as long as you can trust managers will approve it um, appropriately. And similarly with unlimited leave, the, the written policy doesn't need to be adjusted uh, to have any extra justification, any extra grounds to use it. Just to make sure managers will actually approve it if someone uses uh, uh, makes a protected claim, something like COVID-19, like an isolation order. And probably in many cases they already are, but uh, that that's really what you have to consider is, is enforcement, not the written policy. Um, some policies are administered by states uh, or by private insurers. Ultimately, when a state does it, it, it looks a lot like just state-run insurance paid out of a trust. They collect premiums. Sometimes they call them taxes. Sometimes they call them premiums. Uh, both of those are the change would be administered by the state or by the uh, private insurer uh, of that leave policy. So in, in either case, the employer's obligation is really just to inform the employees. Possibly there might be some record keeping changes. There might be some premium changes. But uh, for the most part, the actual uh, administration is going to fall on the state or the insurer. So moving on to New York, this is sort of the, 
the big one, this is going to apply to the most people, uh, the most employers who are nationwide. This is likely to be the most significant overall, both because of how serious the outbreak has been in New York, but also how many just employees there are in, in New York State and New York City. So uh, let's take a look at this one, which is from mid-March. Uh, gives a special accrual bank for uh, COVID-19 leave. Uh, you can't spend on your PTO or any other type of leave first. Uh, the only one is that it is offset by the federal leave that I discussed in a previous video. Uh, and you only owe New York to the extent of an excess that doesn't increase your uh, PTO. Um, in order to cover it, it is separate. So you can't spend down your PTO, but it doesn't give you extra. Um, if you are an employer with 100 plus employees, it's 14 days paid, then it goes to unpaid leave. Uh, if you are, um, if you're a mid-sized employer, excuse me, uh, then you just need, uh, you need five days paid leave, and uh, then it switches to unpaid. And if you are a small employer, which is uh, 10 or fewer employees, or under a million net income a year, then it's purely unpaid. The unpaid leave actually does end up mattering. It is job protected. So that's typical, just same position, same pay and comp, same terms generally. But the job protection matters. So unpaid COVID-19 leave does matter in New York because of that job protection. And in order to get the leave, you have to be subject to an individualized isolation order or quarantine order. Uh, and you can get that from your state or local health authority in New York. Uh, but you also have to be unable to work, including telework or work from home. So really, if you're if you're asymptomatic and your job allows work from home, then the sick leave is not available to you. Um, you have to be unable to work and subject to the order, both of those things. Uh, and to the extent your order keeps going past 14 days, uh, then you could get into the unpaid leave territory at that point. So... Um, there is this exception for risky travel. If your travel wasn't for business and you knew about it, you knew that it was a risky country, according to the CDC. Basically, New York says the employer can treat it as if it's your fault, you're sick. You don't get the paid leave, you still get the unpaid leave. It's still job protected, uh, but not the paid leave. So we'll see if uh, that ends up mattering. Uh, Colorado had an earlier, but a very, very specialized uh, leave law adjustment. It's only for these special industries, leisure and hospitality, food services, child care, education, and related services. So, uh, you know, travel to education, uh, food service at, at, at an educational facility, things like that. And also home health care, nursing homes, similar facilities, uh, though community living facilities, those are, those are all covered. So, um, uh, just those particular industries, it's not going to hit everybody else. So a little, little narrow, a lot, of, a lot of people don't, a lot of employers aren't going to have to worry about it. Um, and it's just four calendar days max of paid sick leave. It was originally just for COVID-19 symptoms and you were going to go get tested. So it's just to get you to stay home until you got your test. And originally, once you got your results, if it was negative, then the leave ends. They actually have adjusted it. So if you've got a quarantine order or an isolation order from your health care provider due to the risk of infection, uh, then you can stay home and you get up to those four days paid. Um, this is really an interesting leave. It's more like a minimum leave guarantee or a mechanism. Uh, if you've got accrued PTO and it's at least four days, then you don't get any extra PTO. If you have fewer than four days, but you justify four days under those requirements I just covered, uh, you get at least four days. So if you've got one day left uh, of PTO, you use up that one day, and then you use the remaining three days from this law. So uh, it's a minimum guarantee. So really what it means is if you have been carefully safeguarding your accrued PTO, uh, and you've got more than four days, then this law doesn't give you anything extra, and the, the employer can choose to, to make you spend down your P, PTO. Uh, but if you you know, had some problem and you spent it down, or you just went on vacation and you spent your PTO down, uh, and you don't have any left, um, then you would still get the minimum four days here to the extent you meet the conditions for the leave. So you're, you're getting tested or you're under a quarantine or isolation order. Uh, so not, not really fair if you've carefully shepherded your, your time, but uh, I think they're more concerned about making sure people stay home. Uh, and this is only going to apply through July 9th or whenever the emergency ends in Colorado. So they might extend it or change it in the meantime, but we'll see. Um, 
Los Angeles just did theirs. Mayor Garcetti just signed it 9.15 p.m. last night, California time, the last day he could sign it. Uh, it is a complement to the federal leave that I covered in a previous video. And that federal COVID-19, you might remember, was under 500 employees. Well, this one is 500 plus, so they're trying to hit the big employers. Um, and they they coordinate with the federal leave, so the max pay is $511, and the max total is 10 days, or 5110 um, And that's just to, to match the federal. And LA's uh, supplemental paid leave can be uh, offset by the federal emergency paid sick leave. Uh, and you would only owe it to the extent there's an excess, but uh, otherwise it's separately accrued from PTO. So you have to you have to burn down all you have to go through all your uh, LA supplemental uh, COVID leave before you can use any of your you can be forced to use any of your uh, regular accrued PTO or sick time. Um, it does require that you get an individualized order or isolation recommendation um, if you are vulnerable, so 65 or older, where you have a, a health risk factor, uh, then that could apply. Uh, if you need to care for family because of an isolation order or recommendation or because a, a care provider or a school is closed or unavailable, uh, then those, those could qualify for the COVID-19 leave. If you're full-time, it's 80 hours. If you're part-time, it's the average hours over two weeks uh, that you worked between February 3rd and March 4th of 2020. Uh, and it's going to run from uh, April 7th yesterday through the end of this year, uh, unless they, they modify it or, or extend it or revoke it. So uh, even though it accrues separately from your current PTO, it is not accrued and paid out at termination. You, you don't get it that way. You just you use this preferentially without burning down your other PTO or sick time. Uh, but uh, this one is, is not going to be paid out to you. So I know in California, that's a big deal, but that is not what this is about. Uh, it is also job protected. It, uh, there's non-retaliation. And interestingly, employees can't waive it. And really, the New York leave should be treated the same, that, uh, especially with regard to PTO accrual. But the LA one is more specific, that employees can't waive these rights. So uh, uh, bear that in mind as an employer. There are also some administrative requirements. I uh, can't require proof can't require that someone show an order or a doctor's note if you ask them and they certify yeah it was there that's all that's as far as you can go if you're used to California leave you've probably encountered stuff like this before uh, there's also an interesting twist where it says upon oral or written request interesting if we get a little more guidance there on whether oral is sufficient without uh, going through the normal process of, of internet I don't think that was intended but we'll see if they meant to add some leniency uh, there's also an exemption for health providers and first responders, and that matches the federal leave law, uh, and an exemption for collectively bargained employees, but only if explicitly waived uh, in the uh, collectively collective bargaining agreement. So probably uh, nothing is explicitly waived so far since they just wrote this. So, uh, But there you go, matches a lot the federal leave. So what are some of these other issues for uh, employer leave and COVID-19. What, what else is going on out there? Well, so a lot of them are trying to coordinate uh, with the federal COVID leave. And we saw in phase two and phase three of the, the stimulus and stabilization, the bailout, whatever you want to call it, uh, the FFCRA and the CARES Act uh, created that emergency paid sick leave and emergency paid family medical leave. Uh, a lot are trying to coordinate with that. And some, you know, an offset, they run concurrently. Are they excess? How are they separate? For the most part, uh, they're trying to run them at the same time. They're just trying to piggyback. Um, and uh, I, I think that that's pretty common. They all have to deal with that, especially any future leaves are going to have to. What about asking for proof? This can be kind of a thorny issue for administration. California, places like Los Angeles and San Francisco as well, uh, are going to discourage a lot of this. They sort of look at the employer uh, uh, a little skeptically and, and don't want you to, to uh, get too, too in the weeds about trying to disprove employees. So uh, for example, I've already talked about LA, but it's, for example, San Francisco changed its paid sick leave ordinance. Previously, you could ask for a note if it was more than three days. Now you, you can't. Um, you can't ask during that. So it's 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 interesting how they extended it uh, beyond the three days. So they, they really just don't want you to ask. Conversely, in New York or in many other states, you are allowed to, to prove it that New York law is contingent on getting an order. So they're actually trying to make it easier for people to request those orders from their local government. So they're, they're trying to facilitate it. So proof is, is almost encouraged in New York. 
work. So uh, inter interesting dichotomy. Uh, there's also the issue of uh, if you have discretionary PTO or a limited leave, obviously you're not requiring proof. It's employee's discretion, um, but you might still be asking for a doctor's note. So you have to figure out how to coordinate uh, paid time off, short-term disability, and and when to give FMLA, right? Because you're like like that LA leave uh, where you can't waive rights, you can't employee can't waive FMLA. If you as an employer know FMLA applies, you got to start applying it. Uh, so you do need to to ask the employee at least for FMLA purposes. But you cannot deprive them of their California, Los Angeles, or San Francisco time if if you're not allowed to ask for a doctor's note. You can't deny that time. So interesting issue, and you do have to consider how how to coordinate all of those things. And uh, you also have to consider how to approve discretionary leave, uh, whether it's unlimited or it's just, it's merely discretionary PTO. Usually the employee asks some kind of manager approval, maybe an administrative process. Uh, you have to make sure that the, as an employer, that the employees can take all the COVID-19 leave that's required by law. And this would apply for non-COVID-19 as well. So just make sure that they're allowed. Uh, interesting little issue in New Jersey. I, I, I can't tell if this was intentional, but they wrote a very brief little law in a whole flurry of laws. And it looks as if it, it seems to imply that a no call, no show is allowed. Uh, normally an employee would have to give notice to an employer, but this law seems to give maybe job protected unpaid leave if you show up later with a notice. Because of the way it's worded, it says uh, requests or takes leave. So if you just take the leave and you have a doctor's note that you had an infectious disease and it was a risk of infection, uh, you can show up and it's job protected and you get reinstated. Maybe this is sloppy drafting, but sometimes these laws are so uh, one-sided, it can be difficult to tell if, if they meant it to be one-sided or not. So um, we'll, we'll see if they expand on that at all. Uh, we also have to consider sometimes sick leave for uh, business closures, right? And, uh, you know, this is just the existing uh, accrued leave laws uh, for, for work closures. So I, meant, uh, I mentioned this before, but Seattle is an example, right? So they amended their paid sick and safe time. Uh, to have COVID-19. Previously, if there was, they did have a work closure, it was closed by health order. Now it's closed for health and safety, and it's sort of any school or care provider closure or facility closure uh, could be uh, a sick time uh, grounds. So uh, interesting, interesting little expansion there. So uh, let's go on to the takeaways. That was a lot. There's going to be a lot more. So many different states and localities have these laws. But what are, what are some of the big ones that we've seen so far? So uh, if there's an individualized quarantine order or a work closure, that could now get sick time. I might not have expected that, but it, it, that is sick leave, sometimes family leave. Um, for a lot of non-employer stuff, you can rely on government insured leave. Just make sure you're communicating with employees. A lot of these are going to coordinate with the federal COVID-19 leave. Make sure you understand how that applies to you and how that applies to your state and local obligations. I'm uh, going to get accrued COVID-19 leave that is separate from your existing PTO. So remember to let people use it preferentially. So far, that's New York State and Los Angeles. Might be more places. I've got that special, uh, just a targeted industries leave in Colorado. So if, you, if that applies to you, be aware of that. And uh, consider the issues about asking for, for proof and administration generally. And the differences between New York and California. And, you know, just remember to be healthy out there. So stay home if you can, wash your hands, you know, wear a mask. Don't take it from, uh, don't take it from a medical uh, provider who needs a high quality one. But if you've got some masks or you, you can make a cloth mask now, I mean, go ahead, go ahead and do it. I know you, it feels silly, but uh, really we need, we need to look out uh, for the transmission. So, you know, do, do what you can and worry about looking stupid later. But uh, appreciate your time. I hope that was helpful. And uh, just want to warn you again that all this stuff might change. So uh, if you're trying to rely on this, you, you get what you deserve, you get what you pay for. Uh, but uh, good luck and stay healthy.